Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Doug Berkey, Executive Director at the Mitchell Institute, and welcome to our rollout of our latest policy paper, Fighting the Air Base, Ensuring Decisive Combat Sortie Generation Under Enemy Fire. You know, over the last four decades, America's ability to defend our overseas air bases has diminished greatly. And our adversaries have built up their offensive capabilities with long-range precision weapons and associated sensor technologies. You know, consider China's long-range missiles. They're specifically designed to put our air bases in the Western Pacific at risk. Sanctuary in that theater simply doesn't exist anymore. And that means our air bases will face salvos of long-range missiles, plus attacks by aircraft and drones that could very well take them out of the fight at the beginning of a conflict. You know, risks exist in Europe, too, given the Russian threat. Just look at what we see in Ukraine every day. So bottom line, without adequate air base defense, the Air Force can't deliver the war-winning air power necessary to deliver decisive effects against our opponents. And that's not just an Air Force problem. It's existential to the nation. And our adversaries know this. And I'd suggest it's encouraging their aggressive behavior. So it's time for us to get serious about air base defense. And this is going to require targeted investments in the right capabilities and sustainable capacity. And to be clear, that's going to take additive investment in the Air Force, plus support from the other services. Now, here to talk more about this is the author of our latest report, Mike Dom. He's done a fantastic job in this effort. He came to Mitchell with an extensive knowledge of the PLA and three decade long career as a Naval Intelligence Officer. We're also honored to have retired Brigadier General Michael Jekyll Winkler join us today. He's currently a civilian senior executive serving as a Deputy Director for Air and Cyberspace Operations for Pacific Air Forces. Jekyll has been focused on strategies to defeat A2AD threats in the Pacific for many years, and base defense issues are integral to his work. So it's great to have him here today, and we look forward to his insights. And finally, last but not least, we welcome Colonel Retired Mark Gunzinger, Mitchell's Director for Future Concepts and Capability Assessments. He served as a B-52 pilot and has extensive experience in the Pentagon, National Security Council, and as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Forces Transformation Resources. He's written extensively about air and missile defense technologies over the years. So with that, let's get the ball rolling. Mike, over to you. So yeah, we'll just jump right into it. Bottom line up front. The Air Force needs to remain a relevant inside force capable of fighting alongside America's allies and partners. I can't emphasize that enough, and I hope we'll hear more from uh, General Winkler on the PACAF side about that. Uh, we need to be able to operate inside the range of enemy threats to create the necessary attack density in a large-scale conflict. We need to be able to use our shorter-range fighter aircraft. Long-range, you know, B-21s flying out of Alaska aren't going to be enough. So to be that inside force, the U.S. military must field cost-effective air and missile defense to ensure that the Air Force can generate a combat-relevant number of sorties. But to date, neither Congress nor the Department of Defense have adequately funded air-based defense in the face of growing threats. And without an immediate reversal of this trend, the Air Force may be unable to operate as an inside force, which imperils deterrence and threatens the ability of the joint force to fight and win in a near-peer conflict. So the paper that we're releasing today finds that a combination of air-based defense capabilities is required to defeat sophisticated adversary threats. We need to disperse forces to uh, multiple operating locations as envisioned by the Air Force Agile Combat Employment concept. We need to field a diverse layered arsenal of active defenses that includes both kinetic and non-kinetic effectors to provide cost-effective protection against incoming attacks, something sustainable. And we also need to significantly increase air-based passive defenses, including early warning, threat tracking, hardening, and substantial reconstitution capabilities, especially rapid runway repair. So the key points that are outlined right up front in the paper, threats that our air bases are gonna face are gonna take the form of sustained complex integrated attacks. These are gonna be simultaneous strikes by ballistic missiles, hypersonic weapons, cruise missiles, armed drones, the list goes on. These adversary anti-access area denial capabilities, or A2AD, threaten to drive U.S. combat aircraft to sanctuary in rear area bases, some of these thousands of miles from the relevant operational battle space. 
And if that happens, as Doug mentioned in the introduction, adversaries might perceive an opportunity. They might be emboldened to achieve their operational and strategic objectives without the deterrent of air power and a timely US military response. But as you see in the call out box there, our analysis demonstrates that a combination of aircraft dispersal, integrated active and passive defense measures, and reconstitution capabilities will allow the US Air Force to generate required combat sorties while under enemy fire. However, we have ignored this problem for so long that a significant increase in active and passive air defense capabilities and capacities is immediately required. Both Congress and the DOD need to move out and define roles and responsibilities for fielding ground-based active missile defenses, resolving long-standing challenges between the Air Force and the Army. Additionally, Congress and DOD should provide funding and allocate necessary resources to enable the Air Force to pursue those three elements of air defense I just mentioned, aircraft dispersal, active and passive defenses, and reconstitution capabilities. So this paper starts with a quote, and I'll just read it here. The increasing vulnerability of the present basing posture could cause the US Air Force to lose a war. No matter what the number and quality of aircraft, extent of preparations, sufficiency of logistics, brilliance of commanders, or skill and courage of its people. If the Air Force cannot mount sufficient combat, uh, su sufficient mission capable sorties, it cannot fulfill its responsibilities in war. That quote was from 1987. We seem to have been in this place before, focused on low intensity conflict back in the day, Vietnam, 1960s, 1970s, more recently, the global war on terrorism. During these periods where the U.S. has been focused elsewhere, our adversaries have developed long-range strike capabilities. And then, as we have now returned to uh, great power competition, during the Cold War, it was against the Soviet Union. Now, it is the People's Republic of China. We've realized a critical deficiency in air-based defense. At the end of the Cold War, the Air Force launched what they called the Air Base Operability Project. It is very similar to what the Air Force has now embraced in terms of agile combat employment and aircraft dispersal. So DID, DOD rather, has identified the People's Republic of China and the People's Liberation Army, or PLA, as the pacing challenge. And we understand that the threat from adversaries like the PLA is growing significantly. As an intelligence officer, I watched massive growth in PLA capabilities and threat over the past two decades. And while those threats are indeed very serious, they're not necessarily overwhelming. Ballistic missile threats, for example, are often cited in terms of thousands of missiles. And I won't go through all the math, but as it relates to threats against our air bases, we can start taking away all of the short range ballistic missiles or SRBMs. They don't have the range and are for the most part targeting Taiwan. What we do need to worry about are the medium range and intermediate range ballistic missiles. Some of those will go against Taiwan, but some will also be held in reserve for other non-conventional missions. But what you really wanna focus on is the number of missile launchers, most of which have one or two missile reloads. So now we're down to maybe 300 PLA missile launchers that can attack us at any one time, but those launchers aren't just targeted against, targeted, uh, against our air bases. They have to go against dozens and dozens of US and allied targets, Army, Navy, Marine Corps targets, allied targets, naval bases, logistics hubs, communications facilities, command centers, the list goes on. Air bases are very important targets, but they're not the only art targets. So the PLA has to spread this relatively small number of high-end missile threats against dozens of target sets across an expansive battle space. So with a limited number of high-end threats, the only way the PLA can achieve operationally relevant attack density is by mixing in lower cost, less capable aircraft, cruise missiles, and drones. And don't get me wrong, those different threats attacking at different speeds from different directions at different altitudes present significant challenges for air defense systems. The bottom line is that addressing complex adversary threats requires a mix of diverse layered active and passive air defense solutions. And with all the focus that folks often give to Taiwan, which is only 100 miles from the Chinese coast, we tend to lose sight of the fact that we're talking about a massive battle space. 
China is as large as the United States and PLA bases are dispersed throughout China. So yes, PLA missile systems are road mobile for survivability, but they can't be in different parts of China at the same time. Medium range missile forces in Northern China can't hit targets in Southern, uh, in the South China Sea rather, and forces positioned in Southern China can't hit targets in Northern Japan. And this reality makes the case for combat aircraft dispersal. Using agile combat employment, using the concept uh, agile combat employment concept, the Air Force should be spreading air bases out across a 2,000 to 3,000 nautical mile front, all across the first and second island chains, forcing the adversary to spread forces and attacks across that battle space. If we, on the other hand, concentrate all of our forces at just a few bases, the adversary can bring more weapons to bear on a single air base. So very quickly, there's a lot of detailed analysis in the report, and I'm not going to go through all of the variables and math here today, but just to give you an idea, we analyzed red force attacks against a notional blue air force. We set our desired fighter sortie rate at two sorties per aircraft per day. The blue line here shows that in peacetime, with variations caused by maintenance availability, we don't have any problem staying above the, 2 uh, the required 2.0 sortie rate. But on day one, Red conducts three waves of missile attacks and then one attack per day for 14 days. So in this scenario, the base has no active defenses. The initial attacks effect effectively shut down the airbase. But with the benefit of rapid runway repair and other reconstitution capabilities, we can get back to 0.8 or 0 .9, 0 0.9 uh, sorties uh, per aircraft per day, 60% below our desired combat sortie rate. So as a proof of concept, if the airbase does have active and passive missile defenses that can defeat just 50% of incoming red threats, we see a jump in a return to operational capability. Now, defeating 50% of the threats was just the number we picked for our analysis, but the red dotted line here shows the marginal increase in return to operational capability after those attacks. But where we really start to make money is with aircraft dispersal. For our analysis, we dispersed the fighters that had been at one base to five bases, one hub and four spoke bases. Each smaller base had active and passive defenses as well as rapid runway repair and reconstitution capabilities. So here the Red Force has to spread out their attacks with the same number of missiles, but across five different bases. Again, only 50% of inbound red threats are defeated, but the smaller attack size allows for greater resilience at each base. The math bears out here that it's a combination of aircraft dispersal, active and passive defenses, and reconstitution capabilities that gets us to that dashed purple line, which is very close to our operational requirement for two combat sorties per fighter per day. So in the paper, we propose an air base defense operational concept, and this really circles back to the threat analysis that the most likely scenario has the adversary attacking our air bases with several different kinds of threats, ballistic missiles, hypersonic glide vehicles, cruise missiles, drones, even small drones like what we've seen in Ukraine and the Middle East. We need that mix of aircraft dispersal uh, active and passive defenses and reconstitution capabilities, but we also need the right mix of active and passive defenses, diverse layered capabilities that can address the adversary's diverse layered threats. And one of the big takeaways is that we need to reserve those high-end capabilities for high-end threats, right? Surface-to-air missile systems like Patriot or THAAD need to be held in reserve for high-end threats like ballistic missiles. We can't be shooting those scarce weapons against drones or cruise missiles. Instead, we need cost-effective intermediate and short-range systems that could be missiles, electronic warfare, lasers, or maneuvering projectiles to create an increasingly dense kill web of terminal defenses the closer the threats get to the airbase. And we have some fantastically capable air defense systems, but the reality is we don't have enough of them and we can't produce them fast enough. Shooting down a drone that might cost an enemy tens of thousands of dollars with a scarce supply of missiles that cost four, eight, or $15 million simply isn't sustainable. We need cost-effective air defense solutions, especially a volume of short and intermediate range capabilities that when combined with those passive defenses and reconstitution capabilities I keep talking about, get us in a good place when it comes to air-based defense. So the report concludes with a number of recommendations to implement everything we just talked about. There are two things I'd like you to take away from this chart. First, I've heard a lot about the Army shortcoming and protecting the Air Force air bases with ground-based air defense. And that is definitely something that needs to get sorted out. And we probably need to establish a former, 
formal rather inter service agreement on air based defense. And, you know, we need the Army to step up with more and better ground based air defense, especially in terms of short and inter intermediate range capabilities. But if you embrace the idea that we're only going to be successful with a combination of capabilities, you can see here that the Air Force is actually responsible for most of its own air based defense sensors, command and control, airborne early warning and, and engagement, uh, building hardened aircraft shelters, camouflage, concealment, deception. So as I was finishing these, this paper, I, I, I received several questions about, you know, how much is all of this going to cost? And that is a difficult question to answer. The Air Force definitely needs to dive into the analysis to determine what is the right mix of active and passive defenses. What I can say is that this mix of capabilities, especially things like passive defenses, camouflage, conceal, concealment, deceptions, hardened aircraft shelter, and runway repair, is altogether going to be cheaper than some magic weapon that they think that we think will shoot down every enemy missile. The Air Force and its joint force partners need a combination of air defense capabilities. But I'll foot stomp the top line recommendation here. We cannot carve out air base defense from existing budgets. The Air Force is already trading away offensive capabilities under existing budget caps. Air base defense needs to be in addition to what we're already spending on combat capabilities, an insurance policy, if you will, to ensure that the shrinking force that we have can survive and operate effectively in the face of enemy attacks. And with that, Doug, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, Mike, really appreciate that. Really fantastic job. And and I would just foot stomp, you know, when people bring up cost, what's the cost of not doing this? And uh, you can look back in history and uh, what did a situation like Pearl Harbor look like? That was a pretty big air base attack. So no, can't agree with you enough. So transition this to uh, questions. Let's start first with Jekyll. I want to open our discussion with you. In 2023, then PACAF Commander General Wilsbach unveiled this PACAF strategy, and it called for diversifying resilient forward basing, which is also something that Mike talked about in his report. Can you provide us with an update on what PACAF has done so far to diversify its forward basing and how your team is measuring progress on that front? Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Doug. Uh, and, and thanks for having me on today. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about anything in the Indo-Pacific, but especially this issue, which I've been passionate about for about the last 12 years out here in Hawaii. And also thanks to JDAM for the great presentation. Um, if you get bored of living in D.C., uh, we're willing to hire you today to come out and, uh, and give the PACAF strategy brief, because I think you pretty much nailed it uh, with what you talked about there in the presentation. Um, and I, you know, my thoughts on this anti-access area denial thing, uh, the opening comments I thought, Doug, were great about China and Russia specifically. But, you know, I, I think even over in the CENTCOM AOR, we're seeing aspects of this with, uh, you know, recent attacks on, on Israel. Uh, and the thing about this anti-access area denial threat is it's actually pretty cheap to build anti-access area denial capability. And like you mentioned, it's really expensive to defend against it. So uh, this is an issue that's not just Pacific specific, uh, but, but a worldwide thing. I think we definitely need to grapple with it as a United States Air Force and as a Department of Defense uh, in whole. Uh, specifically to the diversifying air base access, and I guess I'll give a, try to give a geographic answer to this. There's a lot of bases available in the Indo-Pacific um, running from what we kind of colloquial, colloquially started to call the third island chain. Uh, from uh, Alaska down through Hawaii, maybe into Australia. Uh, our, our challenges there are, are not a lot. We've got great access to bases with allies like, uh, like Australia. Um, our real challenges there are more on the pre-positioning of supplies and making sure that we're ready for the fight. Uh, as we move into the second island chain, again, we've got good access out there with U.S. territory at Guam uh, and the COFA states spread throughout the second island chain. Uh, there are, you know, some ideas that we have that are maybe going to the Federated States of Micronesia. And as we start to dip our toes into that, access becomes almost more of a limiting factor than uh, than our preposition of WRM, making sure that we're ready for the fight. Um, as you move in from the second island chain to the first island chain, that's where, uh, and I, I really appreciate the emphasis uh, on allies and partners, but that's where our reliance on them really starts to go because there's no U.S. territory there. So we are trying to diversify airfields in the first island chain as much as possible, working hand in hand with the Japanese government. And the first island chain generally is that Japan down to Taiwan, into the Philippines, and basically following an arc around the South China Sea 
uh, from Indonesia, Brunei, Malaysia, to Singapore and up through Thailand. Um, we have been doubling down with all of those allies and partners, uh, multiple exercises uh, and working access where we can. Um, the, the tricky part about access, and this gets to the, your question on how do you measure uh, effectiveness. Um, when we're trying to get access to places, that's fundamentally a diplomatic decision for whether or not a foreign government will allow us in. So we're, we're working hard on the military aspect. Uh, and we're trying to, to double down our efforts with Department of State and other intergovernment agencies to make sure that uh, it's a holistic approach. Uh, but ultimately, it's a, a political decision for how we get into those locations, um, which means that we're going to have to operate in a cognitive domain and do a, a, a bunch of stuff about competition uh, in phase zero to include whole of government approaches. And I'll, I'll, uh, I could go on for an hour about that, but I'll, I'll just stop right there. And, uh, and if anybody's interested in that, happy to address it uh, longer in the, in the question and answer session later on. I uh, really appreciate it, sir. So, Mike, you know, as you discussed in your report, you used the metric of generating combat sorties to measure the performance of base defenses. Can you explain why you focused on that and you know, why generating combat sorties is so important for remaining an inside force? Yeah, I think it comes down to three words, effects-based analysis, right? Rather than focusing on uh, you know, what technologies are out there as a starting point or what technology sh we should buy based on the budget that we have. We, we have to get to these core issues, uh, you know, to consider what is it we're really trying to do. The Air Force needs to fight alongside its allies and partners, as, as we've just talked about, and it needs to be able to generate combat sorties to take the fight to the adversary. Now, the adversary, for their part, is trying to stop us from generating combat sorties. So, the focus needs to be on combat sorties. The measure of effectiveness is not, or at least should not be, how many missiles did the enemy shoot and how many missiles did our defenses shoot down? If one or two missiles get through and the airbase takes a hit, the measure of effectiveness is gonna be how quickly does the airbase recover and how quickly can it return to operations and uh, you know get get combat aircraft airborne. And I, and I think to your closing comment uh, you know, during the introduction, uh, this is a no-fail mission. Uh, what is the cost of not doing this? Uh, we need to be able to generate combat sorties. We need to be able to stand alongside our allies and partners. I can tell you, you know, based on what Jekyll just said, uh, yes, it's a diplomatic decision. Yes, uh, you know, the winds of change uh, keep moving around when it when it comes to allies and partners. But if we can't demonstrate that we can fight forward with them, what is their incentive to continue to fight with us? Yeah, I'd like to jump in real quick. Um, I really commend JDAM for taking this effects-based approach. And I, I've been involved in a lot of air missile defense studies over the years in government and out. And as he said, most of them start with, well, here's some technology. How can we use it? Isn't it cool? Or how many threats are we going to be able to knock down by investing in these technologies? But it's the sortie count, the ability to generate decisive combat air power that counts. And that is going to benefit all the services, the entire joint force, which relies on the Air Force providing air superiority so they can conduct their other missions. For providing, frankly, at the start of a, uh, a conflict, be it China or Russia, with a preponderance of precision strike capacity that, again, is going to benefit the entire joint force, the entire campaign. But if you can't do that forward, that we're not going to have the sortie rates, the sortie counts we need to, uh, uh, frankly, win the first part of the fight. Now, it's really well said by both of you. And I think people just need to get their head around how many aim points there are that we have to handle in that kind of theater. And, and it is going to require that that density of forces. And you got to bring them in for the for the sortie generation. Jack, I'll turn back to you. You know, I can imagine that as the Air Force implements its AIDS concept, we're going to need to rely on our allies and partners in the region to remain inside force. And, and you know, Mike just referenced that. But could you walk us through PACAF's efforts to deepen cooperation between allied and partner air forces in the Indo-Pacific? You bet. And, uh, you know, in the intro, you, as you guys mentioned, I'm the deputy director of the, the A36 out here right now. So operations and cyber both in the portfolio. But on the A3 side of the house, we've got a very, very robust exercise program. Uh, usually around 30 exercises per year. Those run the gamut from multilateral exercises with many partners to bilateral exercises with a single ally or partner, usually in their territory, 
usually executed at a base that we may be interested in getting access to. Uh, so we can kind of use those as an operational evaluation uh, of that airfield. Um, in general, our exercise for uh, well, out here in the Pacific, a lot we talk about um, IABO instead of just ABO. It's uh, interoperability, access spacing, and overflight. And, and really, what our exercises are, are designed to is hit on the interoperability piece. And I, I'm not talking just fighter to fighter interoperability. That's interoperability and in everything from airborne early warning or ground based early warning for a lot of our allies and partners, fighter to fighter stuff, mobility exchanges all the way down to some of the things that JDAM mentioned in his brief, like rapid runway repair at our silver flag exercise out at Guam uh, and, and other similar exercises for base defense that we'll do in, in a lot of the countries uh, around the theater. Really, again, focusing predominantly on that interoperability. In conjunction with those exercises, though, a lot of times we'll go out and do a public works project on the weekend or the no-fly days um, where we're, if I can resurrect an old term from the, the CENTCOM AOR, you know, trying to do a hearts and minds campaign or, or, you know, showing some goodwill to those countries. That's a lot of low level efforts, but, uh, you know, over a series of time, the theory is that maybe that springboards into some, some public sentiment that will allow us to get access to some of those locations um, in the future. Uh, but that, that's pretty much what we've, we've been trying to do mostly on the military exercise part is hammer in on the interoperability piece. The tricky part as it pertains to this subject on interoperability specifically is we don't have a lot of allies or partners out here in, in this part of the world that have a lot of significant uh, integrated air and missile defense. Uh, so the partners that we do have that capability, we're doubling down and trying to make sure we're, we're even more effective. Uh, you'll see a lot of that in Japan, in Korea, uh, and Australia is really, really getting there as they see a, a very real threat off to their north uh, as well. Um, and those are some of the exercises that we're, we're, we're kind of trying to either build from new or redouble down efforts on, on, on things that we had uh, done previously out here. Uh, um, in that whole thing, I failed to mention the rest of the joint force, uh, which does have a lot of integrated air and missile defense or counter rocket artillery, mortar, C, uh, uh, counter small UAS uh, capabilities. And we're starting exercises where we're operating more jointly and starting to build some plans actually where, you know, something simple like on the air base air defense, I appreciate JDAM's, uh, Examples of, you know, this was an issue for the counterterrorism fight, and it was less about shooting missiles to kill missiles and more about defending the wire against attacks. Um, you know, China's going to ha probably have some, uh, their equivalent of little green men running around the theater. Um, and I don't know that we're necessarily going to be able to put a significant security forces detachment at every airfield that we're going to disperse to. Um, so a lot of reliance on both our allies and partners in that territory or working very closely with the Army and the Marine Corps. Uh, to take some of their, you know, core mission sets really and add those into our portfolio for air base air defense so that we can operate jointly in this perspective as well. Can I ask a quick question here? The um, When I was doing the research for the paper, uh, I came across some reports, uh, I think from just last year, where they cut the ribbon on uh, 20 hardened aircraft shelters in uh, at Osan Air Base. And I want to say well, I know from the reporting anyway that those were actually built by the Koreans on, you know, what is what is essentially their air base. And as you mentioned, we don't have any U.S. territory there. So I'm I'm wondering when it comes to hardened infrastructure, um, you know, whether it's additional runways or hardened aircraft shelters, um, which way is the wind blowing in the Indo-Pacific when it comes to uh, allies and partners chipping in uh, to build up that infrastructure? Sure. Uh, it's a great question. And um, I, I think the answer is sort of all of the above. I mean, we'll take the help just about anywhere we can get it. Uh, the realities for us in the theater are, um, you know, leftovers from the Cold War mentality. We've got basing access in Japan and Korea, uh, and we've got very, very close relationships with both of those allies uh, to, the, to the point that they actually will invest some of their money to build things on our air bases like you're talking about for the hardened shelters. Um, on Korea. Uh, in Japan, we've got similar things where we've had them build hardened hangars for us uh, and other things around the airfield. A as you go around to the rest of the Indo-Pacific, though, th those two countries, Japan and Korea, are kind of outliers. You know, we, we closed the base down at Clark Air Base after Mount Pinatubo blew back in 1991, uh, and we don't have any permanent bases anywhere else in the Indo-Pacific or really, um, you know, um, agreements with countries to, to build things for us out there. 
Um, but in general, I think your question is really hitting that. Where's the next dollar best spent for, uh, you know, kind of integrated air and missile defense based defense out here in the Pacific. Um, and, and I think it's, again, probably all of the above. We've got initiatives out here in PACAF. We're out in the second island chain. We're rehabilitating old World War II airfields. Um, the reality for us right now is if there's a period of concern in 2027 uh, for the threat, uh, we are past the point that MILCON is going to solve any of our problems. So the rehabilitation of those runways in the second island chain is being done by, you know, Red Horse civil engineers with O&M funding because that's executable inside of one year to try to improve the Pacific. I think you'll see similar things where, you know, if we can work to get some hardened aircraft shelters dispersed in the AOR, we are definitely interested in that. Uh, but by the same token, if that's too expensive, then we can't fit it into our budget. We're not above taking half of a Quonset hut, putting four feet of soil or concrete on top of that and calling that good enough and good to go. Um, so I, I think what you're seeing in the Pacific is a little bit of a shift towards this, you know, in the future out years, let's build towards something and more of a sense of immediacy. Uh, we have got to get the theater set right now. And it, it may not be in the fanciest way, but it'll be in an effective way that buys down risk in the 27 timeframe. I appreciate that. Now, Mike, in your report, you described how a combination of active and passive defenses would greatly improve our ability to conduct based defense operations. Can you dig a bit deeper into this topic and share with us why we need more than just long range kinetic interceptors? You know, what would a more effective blend of active and passive defenses look like at one of our forward air bases in the region? Yeah, so so it's like I said, and I think I said it 20 times in the course of that, uh, you know, 17 minute briefing. Um, it, it does have to be a blend. There is no one solution, and it's going to necessarily be a combination of defenses that win the day. You know, the irony is that for all the moaning about how we don't have enough long-range kinetic interceptors, we don't have enough Patriot, we don't have enough THAAD, that's probably the area where we're strongest. That's how bad this, you know, situation is. Um, you know, Patriot and THAAD or even long-range missiles like the standard missile fire fired from a from a Navy ship that can, you know, they, they can be out there providing defense against high end threats. But where we really seem to have challenges is in terms of shorter range capabilities and those passive defenses that that keep coming up in our uh, uh, conversation here. So at the air base itself, you know, the, the Patriot and the Thad can be standing off or a Navy ship could be standing off the coast and provide that area air defense. But at the air base, I'd expect to see shorter range systems, maybe something like NASAMS. If you've heard of NASAMS, the, uh, I'm not gonna try to do the acronym because I failed to write it down here, but you know, it's essentially a truck mounted or a canister mounted AIM-9X or AMRAM. Uh, these are weapons that the Air Force has experience with. They're hanging off of every combat aircraft in our inventory. Uh, you know, there are some promising technologies out there that I think the services should jump on, like high-powered microwave, electronic warfare, um, even cannon-based air defense, maneuvering rounds fired out of a gun. That can bring the costs way down on, uh, on the cost to intercept. And again, we keep coming back to this, I can't say enough about passive defenses, hardened aircraft help shelters, or even just overhead shades to keep the sun and the rain off. Those type of shelters would allow us to play a shell game with an adversary, right? We could relocate and reposition aircraft, put them under those uh, those sunshades, if you will, um, and and defeat adversary ISR so they don't know where our aircraft are and they have to waste weapons on empty parking areas. And of course, reconstitution capabilities. We have to be able to take a hit and get back up. We can't curl up into a ball and wait to feel safe uh, you know, the conflict is going to be over before that happens. So make no mistakes. It won't be easy. It might be bloody and we will suffer losses. But we're talking about combat, combat with existential consequences for the United States and its national security interests. We have to be operate. We have to be able to operate while we're being shot at. That's just the reality that we're in right now. Yeah, I'd like to jump in here as well. So many of the novel missile defense technologies that JDAM addresses in his report, including those very low cost gun launch guided projectiles and some directed energy systems, now they're sufficiently mature to transition to real world warfighting capabilities 
just as fast as DoD can establish programs or record for them. And there can be highly mobile weapon systems, and, and that should be a threshold requirement for any new inside missile defense. Plus, they're going to be far less expensive than that in Patriot missile batteries. Uh, but the truth is, it's now more a matter of funding than tech maturity. That is a barrier to fielding these technologies, as well as determining who in DoD should pay for them. I appreciate that. And, you know, again, I just can't say enough. Yeah, I get there's a cost, but the cost of inaction is is what truly is existential here. So, so important we get on these. So, you know, you guys all know this, but the Air Force is quickly moving forward with the development of the B-21. And this is an aircraft that can be launched from the U.S. homeland. It's equipped with next generation of, of long-range munitions that are can be able to strike targets deep within China's integrated air defense network. And we can't get those soon enough. But, you know, the question oftentimes comes up that if we have a platform like B-21, why does the Air Force need the ability to operate in a contested aerial environment and strike enemy targets from within enemy weapons range. You know, is attack density a key part of this? I mean, Mike hit a bit upon this, but Gonzo, maybe you could get us off on a little bit more detailed answer here. Sure. Short answer, yes. Now, as our frequent listeners know, Mitchell is a strong proponent of fielding at least 200 B-21 Raiders that are capable of holding any target at risk in a fight with a peer adversary, including maritime targets. No other U.S. or allied military brings a like combination of survivability, very long ranges, and large payloads to fight, which the Air Force will do to B-21. And yes, Raiders and other bombers have the range conduct their uh, initial sorties from the third island chain, our West Coast, but that is not a prescription for rapidly blunting a Chinese offensive in the Western Pacific. Now, I've flown 20-hour-plus bomber sorties, and it's nearly impossible to sustain that for any amount of time. And operating B-21s over intercontinental ranges means their sortie rates would average far less than half a sortie per day per aircraft. And the same math would be true if we choose to operate our fighters from the second island chain from more distant uh, bases. And so it is about increasing our attack density, the number of targets that our air forces can strike today. And that is only going to be possible if we remain an inside force in the Pacific. And let's not forget, our air force also lacks sufficient air refueling targets and other resources to uh, support such an outside force operating concept. And it's sheer folly to uh, say otherwise. Appreciate that. You know, Jekyll, as, as Mike discussed in his report, the Cold War exercise salty demo revealed that the Air Force wasn't as prepared as it needed to be in the event of a Soviet attack on, on European air bases. What sort of training initiatives is PACAF pursuing to better prepare our air bases against future attacks? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. I'll just, if I could pivot a little bit, I'd like to tag on to the, the previous question about the stand in force. Uh, and then I'll answer the, the training initiatives question. But uh, I think it was JDAM actually brought it up in his brief. Um, I'm very concerned about a mentality for war fighting that doesn't have a stand in force, specifically as it pertains to our allies and partners who just for sheer function of geography are inside of the threat, um, you know, underneath the anti-axis area Nile umbrella. And for us to think that we're going to cleanly wage war not standing shoulder to shoulder with them, but fighting from afar and not sharing that risk, I think is a really dangerous concept. I think the same of our joint force, um, you know, our aircraft carriers, our destroyers, our, our uh, you know, Marine battalions and, and Army brothers are all going to be hunkered down inside of the threat, trying to help defend whatever ally and partner in this theater against nefarious aggression. Um, and we've got to have some skin in the game and share that risk. Otherwise, I don't know that we continue to be a you know, a, a great power out here in the Pacific theater if we're trying to wage this war from from long distance. I think also that, you know, the all outside force means you need an all outside kill chain. That means I need ISR that doesn't require to be in the theater. Um, you know, it, it, it basically doesn't allow us to provide any kind of air superiority to the joint force or to our allies and partners, which, as we all know, is going to be a critical enabler to any kind of war fighting that we do. Uh, and it, it just smacks to me of this, you know, pre-World War II idea 
that the bomber is always going to get through. And I think we saw that play out with devastating effect in the European theater. Uh, a similar kind of thing out here in the Pacific. Does, is the B-21's missile always going to get through some of these complex air defense systems that our adversaries have? And if they can break those long-range kill chains or shoot down those missiles, um, we're going to be left with basically a, a non-effective way to take the fight to the bad guys. And, you know, it, it's not going to be a discussion about whether air power was decisive. It was going to be about whether it mattered. Uh, and I, I, hopefully that's not the Air Force that, that we're building towards. Uh, specific, I'm sorry, that was a, a little bit of a long ramble, but again, I'm, I'm kind of passionate about this. And you, know, you mentioned the attack density stuff. Um, you hear a lot right now about pulsed operations. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's a maritime fight out here in the Pacific. And a lot of our maritime munitions were specifically on bombers. With some of the recent modifications that we're making to some of our weapons, we've really unlocked the fighter force to be able to do the, the airborne interdiction and maritime target mission. Uh, and with that, it's, um, you know, I, I liken this back to the, the 2003 war against uh, Iraq, um, where I was airborne for 12 hours at a time in an F-15 looking for Iraqi bad guys to shoot down. Uh, they'd all buried their planes and I didn't have a lot of fun in that, but the density that you mentioned was filled in by F-16s from Ali al Salim, who woke up at six in the morning by seven, they dropped a full load of bombs, and at eight o'clock, they were back getting a rearm and reload so that they could continue that momentum and never let the pressure off the bad guys. I think we've got the capability to do that right now in the Pacific with our fighter force in between bomber pulses. Um, but you can't do that unless you're standing shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm with our allies and partners in this theater. All right. Now, that was a really, really long answer to, to a question that I wasn't even asked. So to pivot quickly onto the training initiatives, um, I... Full spectrum is probably the best way to, to answer the question. Um, you know, I, I think JDM and, uh, and Gonzo kind of outlined this. This is not just integrated air and missile defense in the traditional mindset. It's a layering of, you know, multiple defensive uh, weapon systems and defensive capabilities to try to assure protection. That means we need full scale command and control capability. We are the area air defense commander out here responsible, uh, at least for the high end missile threat stuff. So we do a lot of C2 exercises with our allies and partners and with the joint force. Um, as we get down to the wing level and our idea for agile combat employment, the wing really is the heart of that, the unit of action to make that happen. Um, so we've done a lot of exercises recently, specific the latest one with the third wing from up in Alaska deployed down to Guam uh, and actually ran through a full scale agile combat employment um, uh, exercise. And then even down to the spoke level, where you know we've now got maybe it's four spokes uh, reporting back to one hub, which is consisting of the wing. How do you do sortie generation and really everything from sortie generation and backing that off to weapons loading, refueling, boss eye considerations at a you know remote airfield where you have to stand up a tent city to be active and contracting support to be able to figure out what's available so that we're not doing discovery learning at the type of, at the time of conflict. Um, so, and that's kind of just on the U.S. side, again, doing most of that with allies and partners where possible and really trying to focus on um, all things active defense, uh, all things passive defense, and then really, really interested on in the idea of a passively active or actively passive defense with some of the recent technologies that are kind of spanning those two missions. Um, so that, I apologize for the long answer and, and two questions, one of which I wasn't asked, but those are some random thoughts from out here in the Pacific. Give me those are great answers. It's awesome. Um, Mike, you know, in the 80s, the Army and the Air Force had a memorandum that established what ground-based air defenses the Army would provide to the Air Force air bases. And you recommended that the services establish a similar agreement today. You know, why is that so important? Well, I, th I think it just comes down to, uh, you know, we, we, we all want to do the right thing, but where you stand sometimes depends on where you sit. Uh, I understand, you know, if the Army is going to invest a dollar in, in air defense, that dollar is probably going to first be spent to provide air defense for the Army. Uh, that, is, that is an understandable impulse on, on behalf of the service. The Navy uh, has its own responsibilities for air and missile defense, and that is, again, not necessarily for uh, air base defense or other critical facilities. It's just for fleet defense, and that is is how those those air and missile defense systems are are optimized. So, you know, we we've we've just sort of come full circle again back to that that era in the 1980s where the threat is real, 
we've, we've quantified and qualified the threat. We know what it is that we need to do, and we probably do need to enter into some sort of formal inter-service um, agreement so that uh, so that that we can we can be the best inter-service force uh, that we can be. The the Air Force for air base defense does not need Stinger missiles mounted on an armored vehicle that probably doesn't fit on a C-130. Uh, we probably need truck mounted, canister mounted, uh, deployable, you know, C-130 deployable uh, lighter weight systems that might not have a whole lot of utility for maneuver unit, army maneuver unit air defense, uh, but could be optimized for air base defense, especially in a place like the Indo-Pacific where the distances are so long and air mobility is an absolute necessity. I uh, appreciate that. Okay, we're running tight in time, but I just want to give you guys a, a last bite at the apple here, and and let's split this one up. Uh, if, you know, for Mike and Gonzo, if you uh, caught five seconds in an elevator with a member of Congress, how would you pitch that we need more investment here? Uh, okay, I'll start. Um, I, you know, I I think again, I would. Uh, my elevator pitch would would indicate that the threat is real, uh, the threat is growing, and as General Mattis, our former Secretary of Defense, used to say, the enemy gets a vote, and the enemy has voted that they are going to come after our air bases, and if we do not stand up and defend our air bases against those evolving threats, uh, we're not going to be able to be effective in the Indo-Pacific, or in the European theater, or the Central Command theater, for that matter. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, the threat is such today. I'm going to refer to something Jekyll said. If we can't fight for it, if we can't generate those decisive sorties, if we can't stand alongside our allies to fight and win, we are no longer going to have a great power military. That's a fact. And it's, frankly, we must fund these air and missile defenses if we're going to be able to do that. Yeah, and, and Jekyll, last one for you here. If you were able to get a, a plus up in funding, what's kind of on the short list of what you'd want to invest in? A little bit of everything. Um, no, it's, uh, I, I think the key investment we would make right now, and it may be a little bit counterintuitive, um, if it was available, I'd invest in a, a long range, highly discriminatory, either non-kinetic or cheap per round, uh, effective active defenses. Um, I, but I think the next dollar that we spend, even if that's not available, should probably be on active defenses. Uh, and I say that for a couple of different reasons. One is this idea of agile combat employment. It's it's necessary right now based off of the threat. If we ever got to the point that we were doing effective uh, air base air defense, uh, we probably wouldn't have to do it to the degree that we are, which means the force that we have could operate that much more efficiently. And I don't think that's a factor that just applies to the Air Force. It applies to the the Navy as well as their carriers are, uh, you know, predominantly their power projection platforms and are as vulnerable as our airfields. The other thing that I think that the, that the other reason I think that the kinetic defense uh, or at least active defense is important is this idea of access to allies and partners countries. As much as it's a political decision to allow us into those countries, the next, the first question that's always asked is going to be, what are you bringing to defend us? Uh, and, and what they want is some sort of an active uh, system. So I, I think this is a, a dynamic that builds on itself. The more of this that we have available, the more we may be able to unlock access and the more that we might be able to disperse to further complicate the adversary's targeting cycles. Uh, so not because I think it would be the most efficient way to fight wars, but for the other things that it brings in from an access standpoint, I think I'd go with current and existing uh, active effectors. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And gentlemen, your comments are just fantastic today and very insightful. So again, sincere appreciation. It's time to turn this over to uh, audience Q and A, and everybody knows the drill by now. But when I call on you, please unmute your mic and please state your name and affiliation before asking your question, or you can submit questions using the Q and A function. So with that, let's turn to uh, one typed in here. With the end of the Intermediate Range Treaty, the U.S. Army is deploying Tomahawk ground launch cruise missiles in Europe. Why isn't the Air Force working to reconstitute the Glickham Conventional Program and field this capability in the indo pacom theater or the European theater for that matter? 
for anybody that wants it. I'll take a stab at it while not pretending to be an expert on the subject matter. Um, we've worked with Rand actually. I mean, we're very interested in the idea, and I think the the fact that right now as a joint force, the U.S. is kind of a catcher's mitt for ballistic missiles uh, without having a lot of their own capability that we can throw at the adversary to make this a symmetrical fight, um, I, I think it's problematic. I'd love to have some in my toolkit. Um, I, I think as you, you take a look at the geography around the Indo-Pacific theater, and I can't speak to the European uh, rationale for for not doing more to, to try to get some of these ground launch cruise missiles. Um, but based off of the ranges that are available, uh, we would again be looking for access inside of our ally and partner countries, uh, which comes with a, if we're going to put an offensive capability there that's going to attack Chinese um, targets at least, or, or adversary targets in the theater, potentially mainland targets, uh, there's a there's a barrier to entry for those ac allies to be able to, to give us access to those countries. Uh, increasing range certainly would help uh, if we could end up unlocking the you know some capabilities to put weapon systems out in Guam, uh, back at Wake, maybe as far as Midway. Uh, but really, what we would need, I think, are are shored up base or uh, yeah basing authorities inside of the Pacific Theater uh, in some of these ally and partner countries. And I didn't talk about this previously, but um, one of the things that we are very carefully trying to avoid in this theater right now is while we are trying to be the military partner of choice for all countries, we fully understand that uh, China is probably going to be an economic partner of choice, and that's just driven by trade and, and proximity. Uh, we are desperately trying to not make our allies and partners make a decision on which country they favor in phase zero. And I think that's one of the barriers to, you know, acquiring these expensive weapon systems would be if you don't, you're not sure that you can place them somewhere in the Pacific to have an effect. Uh, is it worth chasing after right now? No, I'll add to that as well. Uh, based on a lot of studies in government and out of government that took a look at the cost effectiveness of long range uh, weapons. Uh, the fact of the matter is the service launched weapons that have long ranges uh, are pretty darn expensive. And it's far more cost effective to deliver warheads on targets uh, using aircraft to carry those weapons in close to the target areas. They're shorter range weapons and carry larger uh, uh, warheads and, and a lot of other advantages to that. So you have to take a look at this from a cost effectiveness perspective as well. And, and I just like to chime in to say that is not what this paper is about. <laughs> so bringing it back to, um, you know, to the to the focus Fair. on the base defense. We, we did talk when we started this project about, uh, you know, to what degree should the paper address uh, what, what we're talking about here, which is offensive counter air uh, using long range strike capabilities to hit the enemy before they can launch a strike on us. And we decided to set that aside. Uh, that is an issue that, that needs to be discussed. And there's obviously geostrategic and political considerations about with nuclear weapons, can you strike mainland China? Can you strike Russia? Uh, but we wanted to make the focus of this paper specifically on not offensive counter air, but defensive counter air. All the things uh, necessary to shoot down incoming threats and then reconstitute uh, and, and restore bases to operational capability. Another question here, and it's was cited in the, in the discussion we've been having, that really time in the budgeting cycle and all is is playing with the clock that we just don't have and so how do we repurpose existing systems that might already be in uh in our inventory and one that the uh, person cites here is something like the mq9 which obviously has sensor shooter capabilities yeah we addressed that in the paper in the paper a little bit i think there's a lot of exciting work that it's being done with uh with uncrewed systems uh, or uninhabited systems. I'm not sure what the turn of phrase is the, these days, but um, you know they have long dwell time. They can get up above the problem. They can look down for uh, for inbound threats and be part of that sensor and command and control imperative uh, that needs to happen to prepare bases for attack and to prepare uh, defenses. Uh, you know to to launch against those inbound threats. Um, so you look at what uh, you know. You look at what what is being done with with the MQ9 and the and the uh, 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 the AESA radar uh, that they've mounted on that. I think that's right now being done principally for for maritime domain awareness, 
Uh, but there's absolutely no reason why that technology couldn't be adapted for, uh, you know, for a counter air uh, uh, type of um, type of mission. Um, as we've talked about, when it comes to passive defenses, uh, we know how to pour concrete and we know how to build hardened shelters. Uh, that is that is, that is not a technology hurdle. You know, a lot of the passive defenses, the camouflage, uh, putting you know, I've got I've got old 1980s pictures of mock-up F-16s that used to be put out on mock taxiways that gave the Soviets something to shoot at. Um, that is not a technology hurdle that we need to overcome. And then on the on the kinetic side, uh, you know what what Jekyll was talking about, and I hadn't really thought through the uh, allies and partners thinking like, what are you bringing to protect us and our cities and our people? Um, we have AIM nine X's and AMRAMs in the inventory, and those can be repurposed as uh, surface to air effectors in the form of NASAMs or something else uh, to provide us with uh, perhaps just a stopgap capability uh, until we can get some more advanced technologies online. Yeah, twenty seconds uh, is completely feasible to integrate with MQ nine size uh, uncrewed aircraft. Uh, uh, non-kinetic weapon systems that can affect multiple threats, electronic warfare, uh, lasers, and and have them as part of this integrated network that uh, uh, JDAM talked about. They can begin to thin the herd of cruise missiles and other suitable targets before they hit the terminal area. Again, the technology is mature enough. It just needs to be funded. Yeah, and just to tag on from, from PACAF on that, we have MQ-9s out here in the theater right now that are doing a phenomenal job in phase zero, whether that's on the ISR standpoint, uh, overwatch of things going on in the second Thomas Shoal right now, um, and then doing a lot of, of uh, intel work, frankly, that's uh, releasable to our allies and partners, and we're using that to great effect. That particular airframe, I don't know that I've got a great use case for it right now in combat. Um, and a lot of the investments that we're making, to Gonzo's point, are more on the let's shore up their capability to do the mission in phase zero, not how can we use that asset that doesn't have a different mission to do in phase one, two, three, four, wherever it ends up needing. So we are, we're actively working right now, and it's all on the asymmetric side of the house, but how do we unlock some of those capabilities uh, maybe to do things like, you know, with the sundown of the E3 and who knows when the E7 is going to come online, is there a way we can use the MQ-9 fleet to provide some surrogate air domain awareness across the theater? Um, and I don't think you can necessarily do that with the current kit available, but those are investments that we think we may be actually able to get showing up here in the theater prior to the 2027 timeframe. I no, appreciate it. Another question here. Uh, person says that we're clearly not going to get any more uh, money added to the top line. Yet, on the other hand, we just lived through 20 years where we saw a huge shift in defense spending priorities to support combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Given the severity of the picture you just painted, why can't we see that kind of shift occur to support these kind of priorities? What's it going to take to make that happen? Well, I hope what it takes is not combat failure. Um you know, fail, failure is actually an option that tends to get the budget process moving. Um, you know, if you, if you look at the plus up, you know, what, what did it take to get us focused on Al Qaeda and defeating terrorists overseas? Um, I, I don't think I need to outline that much further, but, uh, but it is a no fail mission. Um, uh, in, in terms of, of what it's going to take, we're trying to make the argument through this policy paper. Uh, we're trying to help the Air Force define the the suite of requirements uh, that it might consider adopting to go to Congress and act for that, you know, ask for that funding. But at the end of the day, it's like I said, the enemy gets a vote. Uh, we are not doing this in a vacuum and we do not get to determine uh, when countries like Russia or China, uh, you know, take take their next action against one of our allies and partners or you know, dare I say, against the United States. Uh, so it's we're going to have to we're going to have to make choices, and I and I don't know that we can trade away uh, the 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 shrinking capabilities that we have in the Air Force uh, to provide for base defense. But it is a no fail mission, and it is absolutely you know look under your mattress, have a bake sale, do something. But we have to come up with the money uh, to make this possible. 
I, uh, from the PACAF perspective, I, I think we need a strategic approach, uh, a deliberate strategic approach that sticks to the highest threats and doesn't get distracted by other things happening and, you know, flare ups in other parts of the globe. And, and I think we need to ruthlessly prioritize where our future investments are going to be over the next five years. And then through changes in administration and leadership and everything else, just stick with those priorities uh, and continue to fund them. My fear is that, uh, you know, back in 2018, when we had little rocket man in North Korea and we thought we were going to go to war over there, uh, Congress opened up a war chest that had the closest thing that I've seen in my 33 years of military experience to unconstrained funding, um, which, you know, that sort of worked, I guess, uh, for some of the services. We bought a lot of stuff to be prepared for the Korea conflict. Uh, on the Milcon side of the house, we we're still finishing up projects today that were funded in 2018 uh, from that war chest. Uh, if we open up that war chest to try to buy down risk with China 90 days prior to a conflict, we are going to be caught flat footed uh, and eventually, you know, inevitably end up fighting the conflict with the kit that we've got available today. So uh, it, we can't rely on some, you know, fly by night solution that's going to show up on the heels of a conflict for funding. We need to, that strategic approach and ruthless prioritization, I think, moving forward to, to be ready for this threat. That's incredibly well said. And I think that's a great way to wrap this presentation. Gentlemen, I cannot thank you enough for your comments, your insights, and sharing your perspectives. You all have a very busy schedule. So really, again, thanks for your time with us here. And to our audience, we really appreciate you as well. And so thank you for, for joining us. Mike's report is now online on our website. Please download it, uh, slide deck, and this presentation will be there as well. And Mike, congratulations on Home Run for your first report here with us at Mitchell. We can't thank you enough for everything you put into this one. And this really is a crucial perspective and look forward to it circulating. So to our listeners, this report is up at the website, head there. And with all of that, thank you all for joining us. Hope you have a great air and space power kind of day. Take care.